Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our first ever podcast uh, brought to you by the Pods Association. We have a, a great group of people that are going to be uh, talking all about capitalizing on data as an asset. Uh, it is June the 28th, 9 a.m. Central. We're so happy that all of you could join us. We had over 160 people RSVP for this. So we are gonna be uh, recording this session and it will be made available on the Podge channel afterwards uh, so that we can share that with everybody if you are unable to make it. So we have a lot of stuff to cover today. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Monique Roberts. I'm the Executive Director of the Pods Association and we're super excited to bring you uh, this awesome content. This is gonna be a regular series. We think we're very punny here at Pods. So that's why we're doing Pods Cast. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we want to make sure that people can um, uh, speak informally and also formally about a lot of these great topics, because the key to all of the topics that we're going to be covering is that people are talking about them. So real quick, we're going to do a safety moment. It is hot. I mean, seriously, I was up in St. Louis for SGA a couple weeks ago. I got on an airplane here in Houston, flew very quickly, very fast. Uh, for an hour and a half, got off the airplane in St. Louis, and it was just as hot as it was uh, in uh, in Houston, which blows my mind, right? You think you go north and it should be cooler, but it's not. So we need to make sure that we keep our eyes on the people around us. There's a big difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, right? With heat stroke, you may lose consciousness and you need to make sure that you call 911 versus heat exhaustion and make sure that you get in a cooler uh, dry air conditioned place. I, I put out a little meme the other day that said uh, the Houston Weather Service had said um, to watch out for extreme heat, to not go outside after 10 a.m. until November the 10th, <laughs> if you can help it, right? So just make sure that, you know, if you if you do have a rapid strong pulse that you may lose consciousness and make sure that you call 911 rather just get in, uh, getting into a cool uh, place with some AC. So. With that, we have a, a quick agenda review of the stuff that the, the guys are going to be covering today. We want to make sure that everybody understands that asset knowledge is essential to competent compliance, uh, enterprise risk management, and as well as it's, it's paramount for safe operations. So the guys are going to cover quite a bit of stuff there. Before we get started, um, we just wanted to give a quick overview of, of why, what POD is and why it's so important. A lot of you may be uh, just brand new to PODS and might not understand what PODS is. So PODS stands for the Pipeline Open Data Standard and we're the PODS Association. So a nonprofit member-driven organization, um, which uh, 25 years ago started the build out of a standardization of a data model and data tables. And this was based specifically around integrity management and has been used uh, for, for decades afterwards. We've of course evolved the model to where it's now supporting um, more of the asset lifecycle outside of just integrity management. Um, and it's also uh, supporting some prescriptive business processes um, in and around um, your processes for integrity management. So at its very base, PODS is a way to standardize and organize data. And the PODS Association, is uh, its mission is about providing that transparency to your data so that you can uh, safely operate your pipelines. And it was, it was created by operators for operators uh, with the support of service companies that really understand pipeline and really understand data. So um, more to come on pause and what we're doing. Um, we wanted to first figure out who you guys are before we tell you all about our panelists. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll real quick. And while I'm launching that poll, you can go in to um, if you're using a secondary or a tertiary monitor, make sure that the quick poll, the blue quick poll is in your primary monitor. Uh, that way you can uh, answer those questions. And so what's your role in asset knowledge and data management? And you can choose multiple, right? Um, a lot of people may just choose the first one, which is that they use it uh, day to day in their decision making and, and they use it um, for their role. And some of you are more specific in and around workflow and data collection, investigation, the point of this here is that data touches everyone, right? And that data is paramount for everyone doing their jobs. So we need to make sure that that data is complete. So while everybody is uh, doing those polling questions, I'm gonna ask 
Mr. Jeff Weiss to start us off with a quick intro of him. Welcome, Jeff. Uh, so 15 minutes? Is that what it no. Was? no, 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 no. <laughs> hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jeff Weiss. Happy to be here I'm with three good friends, and I mean that. Um, you know, Monique and I worked together for a number of years. William and I have been friends for years. Todd and I have recently connected. I really feel simpatico with this crowd, so really enjoy being with them. Thank you, Monique, for the invitation. Uh, I'm coming to you really as a freelance consultant at this point in my career. I spent uh, 30 years with the government, mostly in uh, regulation and risk management. Uh, 15 years in offshore oil and gas, and then 17 years with the uh, group called FEMSA in the US DOT, and I was leading the Office of Pipeline Safety there for about 10 years before leaving. Most recently uh, served with senior VP at TRC companies. So uh, that's really it about my background, but uh, I have a, we'll get into this a little bit, but I have a long history in pipeline uh, integrity and performance. I like to say performance versus compliance, and I can explain why at a later point if you like. But uh, I also have a long history with pipeline accidents since we got involved in everyone in America. And they just being involved in those has taught me a lot. So, Monique, maybe that'll do for now. That's great. Yeah. And I'm going to hand it over to William next. Yeah, Monique, thanks so much. And I want to thank you, Monique, for uh, opening up this opportunity. As Jeff said, uh, great friends amongst all of us here and uh, just a great opportunity to share uh, a little bit more about our careers. My name is William Mohica. I'm with NICE, where I'm the Senior Vice President of Utility Technical Services um, and also Asset Risk Management. In my background, I've been in the industry for about 23 years, Oil, always in oil and gas. Uh, both on the gas side and the electric side, but predominantly on the gas side. And I think something that brings us together is uh, we all love to learn. We love to learn about what's happening in the industry and our backgrounds uh, have some connection to that. I've had a chance to now work with several utilities and uh, this topic that we're going to be covering today is of high importance, I think, for all of us and really looking forward to today. Back to you, Monique. Thanks, William, so much. Appreciate it. And everybody, um, Next up is going to be Todd Patterson, who uh, was with Buckeye, but also the president of the Pods Association. So I mentioned that we are a volunteer member-driven organization, so we're very lucky to have Todd with us today. Thanks, Monique, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join in this morning. We hope you find the information we're going to talk about valuable. And uh, before we look at the poll results so that we can tailor some of our comments to your interests, a little bit about me, I'm with Buckeye Partners, currently responsible for Buckeye's Enterprise Asset Management Program, which is essentially capturing information about our assets to be able to understand how they're performing, and making sure we perform the right level of maintenance on those assets, or if it's time to, to have them replaced, be able to get the right asset management plans in place as well. Prior to being the Enterprise Asset Management Program Manager at Buckeye, I led the Geographic Information Systems team and prior to Buckeye was in an electric utility for 15 years. So I come with a diverse background related to asset management across the board and really pleased to have you all here, uh, not only to share some information about what we all know about asset management, but also from a pods perspective to give you a little bit of information about how pods may be able to fit into your asset management strategy. So with that, Monique, if you would share with us the first poll results and let's take a look and see who we've got. Absolutely. I think everybody can see that it's it's split up quite a bit. We have a great group of people that are joining us today. Can you guys all see the results? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So it seems like, yeah, data touches everybody um, in all of the work that they do. So thank you very much for uh, sending your results in. I want to remind everybody that um, we are recording this, so it will be made available later on. If you do have questions, as uh, the guys are running through all of the great content that they're going to cover today, please put those into the questions box or the chat box. And as we have time uh, throughout the podcast, I'll go ahead and ask those questions. If we're unable to get to all your questions, we'll make sure to get you some answers um, 
after the podcast itself. I do want to say too that um, everybody got dressed up today for the podcast. So if you want to pull down the everyone bar so you can view everybody's webcam and uh, and uh, you'll be able to see us throughout the presentation as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, who's going to kind of level set us, right? Give us an understanding of of uh, what and why and how and when and answer all the questions. So Jeff, if you don't mind walking us through how we got here. Great, thanks, Monique. Yeah, I after as we were talking about doing this podcast and understanding what a diverse audience we could have, I was hoping that it might be useful if I just say some things that I think might be obvious to a lot of you, but they set a context for our discussions on data and risk management, really. So things that I think are obvious to people, but get lost in national debate sometimes is that energy is the essential lifeblood of our economy, whether it's our comforts, our mobility, and believe me, even national security. Um, I had a lens into this stuff for a long time when I was with FEMSA, dealing with everyone you can think of, all the other federal and state agencies. Um, most recently, it was uh, as I was thinking about this stuff, I went back out to one of the sources I use, and I'll show you some data from them in a minute. But uh, every year, the U.S. Department of Energy puts out an annual energy report um, in which they take all sources of energy in this country and put it in a common denominator and then give the results. So the punchline on that was two thirds of all energy of all forms consumed in the US is uh, oil and gas, really. And I'll show you that in a second, but I wanted to make the point that pipelines transport the majority of this energy. I think we all know this, right? But it's important to consider. We're, we're in a different kind of environment than we were in 10 years ago even, right? Climate change has uh, galvanized a lot of resistance to new pipelines. And the kind of the result of that, I'd like to point out and why I think this discussion is particularly important is um, with oil and gas dependency extending for decades ahead, again, I'll show you this in a second, it's gonna be really important for us to take care of existing infrastructure, but the challenge of building new. So uh, I think that one of the fundamental parts of that is understanding risk management. And uh, as, as Monique knows, you know, I've always, I like to simplify things so I can better communicate them. To me, risk management really boiled down to accurately knowing your system and knowing what's around it. And there are a lot of details on that, but that's the punchline on risk management. Monique, can we go on to the next slide? Absolutely. I wasn't sure if I could do that. Thank you for helping. Yeah, so, no problem. So I stole, um, but I did, you'll see, I cited my sources. I, I mean, um, borrowed. Borrowed, okay. I borrowed some stuff from the US Department of Energy. This is pretty, pretty useful information and it hopefully sets us context. I'm really stoked about renewable energy and I think it's coming on and I think it's going to be the future, right? Just not as soon as a lot of people want, including me, right? So I don't think anybody here is uh, opposing renewable energy. What I'm concerned about is a lack of a plan to get us there, right? Um, and I realize there are a lot of vagaries in that, but if you'll see the sources there, really two thirds of this is still coming from petroleum and natural gas. Forget about coal, you know, as another source of fossil, it is declining as the slide on the right shows. I like the breakdown too of the renewable sources and how much is coming from where. You can get this by the way, from the Energy Information Administration. Uh, and I, I highly commend them as a neutral source. I've also seen great analyses by BP and Exxon, but I kind of feel compelled to use a more neutral source here when I'm talking with a diverse audience. The, the chart on the right makes the case um, from DOE's standpoint, and after all the analysis that they've done, is that petroleum and other liquids and natural gas are going to constitute the majority of our energy supply for some time to come, right? So, Monique, if we can move on. 
This one I just put in for fun. This is an ice strain, but if you really look at it later, you know, we won't spend time on it now. It talks about where the energy that we consume comes from and where it goes, which sectors are taking how much energy. And you can then begin to break down the problem. What's it gonna to take to put together a plan so that we have reliable, affordable, secure energy in this country and not hurt people by cutting off the energy supply precipitously. We can go next, money. Oh, wrong way. There we go. No, I'm totally confused. I'm gonna to have to go back to the beginning and start over. <laughs> <laughs> so I told you that I spend a lot of time with pipeline accidents and I, I'm not saying this for any purpose other than to say that yes, you know, I, I think pipelines have had a remarkably safe record and perform very well for a long period of time, given that we have what 2.6 plus million miles of pipelines out there. They provide two thirds of the energy of this country. Uh, that said, um, as you can see from these two charts, the one on the left shows you 20 year history. Um, you know, a, another 260 fatalities, over a thousand uh, injuries and uh, 11 billion in it's my guess, hopefully educated guess, that this is sort of an, a low, low count. I think there are a lot of things that are not included, you know, for a ton of reasons. The chart on the right is meant for no other reason than to say these are the general causes. And while we can say that some things are controlled and some are not, I think almost all of these are mitigatable in one way or another. If for no other reason than for us to understand them, you know, intervene where we can and avoid what we can. So uh, fundamental causes, we can go on, Monique. I think this is my last slide, but it's where I kind of wanted to wrap up by saying uh, in the broader um, ecosystem, you know, in the risk management field, pipelines are classified with a lot of other things as a high hazard enterprise. Um, we know that failures are sensational and costly. I'd also, I've, I've worked with William a lot on safety management systems, and as William knows as well as anyone, you know, things are changing around us all the time, right? And we need to be able to calculate how to adapt to those changes. Um, again, knowing our systems and knowing what's around it and how they interact is part of that. I, I will go on a little bit of a limb by sticking my neck out and saying that one of the things that's concerned me in the US is we do focus on cost and blame. Um, and the media and politicians have frenzied this up and created a narrative that goes out there that doesn't balance a discussion on what our dependencies are and the benefits that we're deriving from it, let alone how we're gonna meet those needs of people um, when we talk about eliminating things. I think it's driven by a very vocal and honestly, I think for the most part, well-intentioned group of people, but I do know they will not be around when energy needs are not met and we have disruptions in our society. Lastly, and let me hand it back to you, Monique, by saying, you know, risk management, know your system in detail accurately, know what's around it, you know, what's around it can affect your system and your system of failure can affect what's around it, right? Uh, I'll leave you on that note by saying, I, regulatory compliance is not equal performance. Uh, all regulations are a product of negotiation. They are not a bar for saying, do this and you'll be safe. You know, they're the best guidance that's achievable under the circumstances. Um, and uh, so I'd ask everybody to shoot a little higher, right? You know, shoot for perfection. You know, you might get excellence out of that. Thanks, Money. Jeff, thank you so much. I'll speak for everybody in saying we really appreciate you spending time with us this morning. Uh, Jeff's just a wealth of information. So if you if you want to talk about any of this stuff, especially related to PSMS, hit him up on LinkedIn or reach out to me. I can get you his contact information. I know that 
He'll spend hours with you on the phone. Talk. I'm just joking. It's a wonderful, always a wonderful discussion with Jeff to do that. Best boss ever, Jeff. Um, so thank you again for all of that. And I know that you're going to sprinkle in uh, some more of, of all of that wealth and knowledge that you have for the rest of the of the podcast. But for now, before we transition over to um, our operators to talk about, you know, what um, asset knowledge management and capitalizing on data means to them, uh, we're going to do one more uh, poll question. And this one is kind of, um, you know, has an ulterior motive, right, of course. Um, you know, how many of you have been involved in a pipeline failure, unfortunately, and then was lack of knowledge a factor? So your options are, I haven't been involved, I've been involved, but I don't think knowledge was a factor, and then involved and knowledge was a factor. So kind of a, a loaded question here. Um, but while they're answering that, um, you know, again, don't forget that you can ask questions in the questions box or into the chat box as well. Uh, which I'm going to check both right now and see. We don't have do we any questions to, yet. Do we get to guess, Moni? Meanwhile, we're waiting for people to vote. Sure. Well, I mean, who, how, what do you think is going to be the largest percentage? Well, well let's go to uh, William and Todd first. You know, uh, I'll, I'll take a guess. I think most individuals on the call probably haven't been involved in an incident. So I'll take a swag at that and say that that's probably a small percentage. Uh, yeah, so what do you think? To, um, that probably most haven't been involved but you know if you kind of take that then to the next step about knowledge and if you kind of embellish we don't have that question if you haven't been involved but probably knowledge was some level of factor right whether they knowingly knew what they had information about or didn't right yeah all right well part, drum roll. I, used, I used to ask that question when i would give presentations and it was shocking to me how you had um you yep. know so there's two-thirds right uh it's not good or bad it's just that it's an opportunity to learn right and it also galvanizes your desire to improve i think once you see the consequences of that and jeff i think it's a great question because it really gets to the heart of an issue something you and i have spent a, quite a bit of time talking about you know there, there's you, you can look at it this way there's three types of companies out there companies that have had an incident and have learned from it <laughs> Right. The companies that have had an incident haven't learned, and those are the companies that we usually read books about, or mm -hmm. companies that haven't had their incident yet. And yeah. we hope that it's these types of discussions that get those companies to think about. We may not have had our incident, but how do we learn from those that have? So, good, good question. Yeah, Excellent. William, that's very well put. And so, just to level set everybody, right? So, Nice Horse and uh, Buckeye, of course, are, are both Pods members. Nice Horse being you know, uh, a premier LDC Buckeye being predominantly midstream transmission, um, and and but both have both a, a multitude of different types of assets to which you know this asset knowledge management applies. So our next step in this podcast is going to be you know these two guys talking specifically about their experience, which is what we all want to know, right? How do we learn from each other? So guys, there's a ton of questions here. Where do you want to get started? Well, I think I'll jump in first um, and kind of talk a little bit about the transition from that poll question and to William and Jeff's point that if you haven't been involved with an incident, that's a good thing. And hopefully it stays that way for your career because they are never pleasant to be a part of. But hopefully what we can learn from what others have done. And the whole point of the discussion for today around asset management is really about risk informed decision making. And that's fundamentally what asset management is about and why we need to capture asset information and why data really is an asset for the corporation itself. It's all about understanding our assets, where they are, what they are, what they're carrying, how long have they been there, how have they been performing. And so it's all the information that's related to those assets that's absolutely critical, not only for risk-based management, but also just a, a, an informed decision-making about how are we gonna manage the assets? How are we gonna replace those assets? And it fundamentally comes down to the TVC, the acronym that we all know and love within the industry that makes sure that information about our assets are essentially traceable. We can rely on the data that are related to the assets themselves. They're verifiable, that the data are accurate, that we understand the lineage of what we've captured about when was it installed, how has it been maintained, and finally complete, so that we know that we've got the complete picture, there aren't gaps in the data itself. And for many of you that are joining the pods for the first time and hearing about pods 
and trying to understand, well, what does pods provide related to data management? It's fundamentally trying to help fill in those gaps where we to make sure that data are traceable, verifiable, and complete. Completeness is the key. It's making sure that we don't have those level of gaps. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later about how pods helps you to be able to fill in those gaps and make sure that we've got consistency across the industry. And that's fundamentally why pods was started. 25 years ago, people sat in a room and they said, we've got an issue. You know, how we capture data is not consistent. As we move data amongst ourselves because of acquisitions, divestitures, or even just new construction projects, it becomes problematic because we all looked at data just a little bit differently based on our own individual corporate needs. And so pods came about as really an effort to try to look at consistency across the industry and start to solve some of those problems. So those are the kind of things that we'll talk through when we, when we deal with asset management. William, what uh, would you like to add in? Now, Todd, I think you covered it well. The, the only other thing I would say is that everyone has a starting point. I think we often think that things have to be perfect for us to go down this journey. And I, I would offer to everyone who's listening today, wherever you hear us starting from, there's always a great place to start. Perfection is not our goal right here. It's continuous improvement as we go forward. Jeff talked a little bit about SMS. That's the bedrock of SMS. Plan, do, check, act. Start there and continue to build on it. So I'm excited to go through these questions, Todd, Monique, Jeff, because I think we're going to be able to dive into a little bit of, uh, of, of the background around how we all got here and what, what, what do we see as very important with respect to assets and data. Agreed. So I'll kind of start at the top and just talk a little bit about my passion for asset management and everybody's going to have a little bit different of a perspective, but mine really comes from the spatial side. As a geographer, that's my starting point for everything. It's understanding where are things. And that's very fundamental to the asset management strategies that we're talking about here is knowing where our assets are. And that may sound very simplistic, but if you think about how our industry has evolved over many years, that it's not very easy. There weren't geographic information system technologies that were pretty sophisticated years ago when it was paper-based. It was pretty much... A, a, say an educated guesswork about where things were and even as we evolved and started incorporating global positioning systems the gps points were only as good as where we really thought that we were and in some cases there are accuracy concerns in some cases we may have been looking at the wrong pipeline you think about very crowded corridors who might be capturing data for a, a different place or a different company and so it really comes down to what well, that first question, where are the assets? And that's one of the first fundamental pieces about asset data because it's knowing about where our assets are. And then we kind of take it from there and start asking the other kinds of questions. William. Yeah, Todd, th thanks. I, I truly appreciate that. I think we share some, some commonalities there. One of the things I, that I would share with, with this audience is, you know, for me, it starts with people and safety. And at the heart of everything we do, that, that's what we're really trying to get to with, with our data. I've had the opportunity now uh, to work with three different companies that have suffered through an event. And having gone through that in my career, I've recognized that at the end of the day, every single event, back to Jeff's point, and we'll hear him talk more about that, is that every event was tied to some amount of data that we had or the lack thereof. So something that I grew very passionate around is that as an engineer almost 23 years ago was I, the data I had helped me make better decisions. Um, and knowing that has helped me grow into what other data do we need? Do we need GPS data? What attributes are important? What are critical attributes? How, how do we take chunks at data enhancements so that we can make the right decisions, ultimately getting to risk reduction per dollar spent? If I have that next dollar available to me, where do I want to invest that? How do I make the right decision and make sure that dollar's going in the right place so we can keep safety at the forefront as we go forward? Absolutely, and, and I appreciate your reinforcing safety because as everybody noticed, we started our discussion today with a safety topic. And as we typically do within our industry, we we'll keep safety on the forefront. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much work to be done in this area about asset management, because fundamentally, if we start and say, well, we didn't have the digital technologies and even some of the technologies about capturing information about our asset performance continue to evolve or, or, or driving us to be able to have the right level of cost benefit analysis to be able to have that risk informed decision making. When we look at where our records have been, predominantly it's been paper based. And so as we move into the electronic world, the key issue for all of us has been well, okay, even if we know the where, which might be the simple question to answer, it's everything else associated. Well, what exactly is it? What is it carrying? What has it carried? Knowing that lineage, that history. 
And as we look at the paper base that we have to go to, finding those records can be a challenge. It's either, you know, hunt and peck through volumes of information, or in many cases, that information just isn't there anymore. You know, it, it was destroyed in a fire or a flood, or because we moved from one operator to another operator, that somewhere those records got lost in translation. And that's one of the key challenges that we focus on is we need to have that baseline of information. And that's a huge issue that we need to continue to work through to be able to come up with some basic information about the assets themselves. Hey, Todd, I'll kind of take the second question there around why is asset data so important and why is uh, data an asset and kind of mix them in. So apologize, team, but I'm going to combine two of them. For, for, for me, I think it's important to recognize that the data that we're talking about wasn't data that 70 years ago someone thought was important. And oftentimes, Todd, you said it, most companies grew through acquisition, which meant we brought the DNA of that company into a much bigger company. And oftentimes, again, what was important in 1920, 1930, 1950s, 1970, maybe not, maybe may not be what's important today. So to me, assets, uh, uh, data has become an asset. Uh, as we've talked more and more about it, because we're recognizing that there's information that tells us a story. There's information that tells us around how to make this multivariable equation around risk really work to our benefit. How do we take all of the information that that pipeline is telling us about how it's lived its life to make an informed decision about how it's going to continue to live its life? Do we need to make a decision that changes the course of business? I look at GPS as an example. There is no way that someone 60 years ago could have said, hey, you know, it'd be a really good idea to start thinking about this concept of GPS and GPS inner lines. What we're finding today is when we have an accurate placement of our facilities, coupled with all the attributes from that asset, coupled with what's around our assets, right? We could design a perfectly uh, safe system, but we still have interactions that are happening through the communities we serve. When we have all that information, we're able to make better informed decisions on how to protect our assets, how to sustainably manage our assets, and better yet, understand if that asset's showing any condition that may warrant replacement. So I think this, this is a, a great concept to talk about. I, I wish there was more energy around it in the industry. Every opportunity I know that all of us get, we try to talk about why data is such an important asset. But I think it's something that's going to be even more important as we go into the future. And, and Jeff, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you because I know you're pretty passionate about a, a, a data as well. Well, I am. And I was just getting ready to jump in. I've been trying to lay back. You know me, William. But, um, you know, it's kind of interesting to me that I've, throughout my career, I've watched a lot of acquisitions and mergers. And I've been involved as a service provider in trying to do due diligence. And I was stunned by the fact that on, on a major acquisition, uh, when we were asked to do due diligence, they said, well, it's okay, but you got to have it in here by the morning, tomorrow. You go, what? And they go, well, we just need a, a brush. And you go, all we could do is land and take a look around and write up a report and send it to you. That'll be good. And they go, you know, it's actually not good. You know, I think most of us buy houses and we do a better job. We hire inspectors and whatnot. This is not endemic to pipelines. I saw it in the offshore when the uh, acquisitions were made there, they would say there's paper floating in the water. You know, Some companies didn't transfer records and the acquirer did not ask for them and insist on it. So to me, you know, the other thing, William, that I wanted to add in here, and, and you did a wonderful job of setting it up is saying, you know, what we know today will not be the same as what we know in five years or in 10 years, right? The susceptibilities of different materials is a good example of that, right? When when low frequency ERW pipe was manufactured, everybody thought it was great. And they put a lot of it in the ground and not all of it's bad, but over the years, we learned that certain vintages of certain materials have susceptibilities that we can watch and we can factor into our risk calculation. So, I think there are a million reasons, William. I'll leave it by saying that I've always thought, I wish that we could capitalize data, right? How it, your desire to get capital to acquire data that you might be missing, because as we always say, there's a magic thing of know what you know for sure, 
and then know what you don't know, right? And then you can do a much better job on risk. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, I think Jeff, I'll, I'll kind of add into your point about what do you know and what don't you know? And as uh, even William mentioned about years ago, we didn't think about using GPS. One of the critical factors as we look at asset information today is, well, where are we going for tomorrow? And not literally tomorrow, but looking over the next five, 10 years and the technologies that'll be enabled. And certainly we think about buzzwords like digital twins and how we capture information about our assets and start to model what the system looks like in a digital environment. And we start to bring in technologies like virtual reality, where I don't have to have people everywhere, that if I've got cameras or I've got a way to be able to communicate with someone, I can give them directions. So it's again, information about those assets and what they're like, so I can have the right level of expertise to support them. And finally, even AI, artificial intelligence. Well, what exactly does that mean? And I would suggest that it kind of drives us to more basic questions about what do these terms mean? How are we gonna employ those? Because in the three terms I used, you probably all have different perspectives on what exactly those things are. And that comes down to a fundamental issue about governance, really defining what are the data. And it seems very basic, but it's critical because we need to understand what we're talking about and make sure we've got that level of consistency. So governance becomes a huge overarching factor and it's not fun, but it is critical to be able to put a, date, a baseline of definition around what are we talking about when I say a pump? Is it mainline? Is it a secondary pump? Is it supporting a tank? So do we call them different things if we have a different kind of pump? So again, just kind of a baseline of, of some of that governance and defining the terms themselves. Todd, you mentioned the word governance. It's, it's a term that I don't think we use enough. I appreciate you bringing it up. And I think a common question for all our listeners that one can ask at the company you're at is pick a certain data attribute and say, just ask the question, who owns it? Who owns the data? And yeah, if the yeah. answer you get is Jeff owns it and Todd owns it and Monique owns it and William owns it and we all kind of do this as a team, guess what? No one owns it. Yeah. And that is, I think, a critical challenge we have with governance, right? We take these really, really important attributes that we're talking about, whether that's your GPS data, whether that's your pipeline attributes, pick your flavor there. And we really need to make sure that the, the, the great work that we start doing, the small steps we start taking in data enhancements have ownership so that through time, we really can make sure that the governance is, is holding uh, its water with respect to making sure good data is is inputting into our system. So great, great, great item there. You know, I'm just gonna add really quickly, Monique, I know we need to move on on the other slides, but I recall we used to do system assessments for people. And we'd say, before you do a lot of this investment, let's get the structure there. So you do it once, right? Yeah. Don't do it and then have to redo it again in five years because other people had ownership like William was just saying, and they were making changes without others knowing it. Uh, yeah. So governance is crucial on that. It is, and, I, and I'm gonna throw a curveball into the guys and say, you know, we always say measure twice, cut once, right? So, you know, and I know we're gonna get into it about, you know, how do you eat the elephant, but I'm also gonna ask the guys, you know, what's, I think we've established why it's important, right? We've all established that this is the, it's the undercurrent, it's the base of our operations and to operate safely, but you know, how do you future proof this, right? So once you get started and once you get rocking and rolling and once you've, you've gotten your plan in place for that continuous improvement that William talked about, you know, is there anything you can do to future proof it? I mean, Todd, you talked about AI, like that kind of stuff can be overwhelming, right? Especially whenever you're just starting out. So, you know, I, I know those are trends in the industry, right? Future proofing and AI and, and all of these things. What what else are you guys seeing um, in the industry? And, and, and how are you specifically, you two guys, carrying your vision, right, and your passion um, around this into your organizations to make change? And I think I'll start with that, Monique. And it, it's a great question because as William was talking about ownership, it also comes down to having a champion. So if everybody owns it, nobody owns it. But if everybody has a hand in it, who's really championing where we're going within our organizations and within the industry itself? And so from Buckeye's perspective, they looked at that years ago and said, we need to have a point person, which is why I'm in the role I'm in today. It's somebody who we can say, if we have something around how we're handling our asset management strategy, who do we go to and who's driving that vision across the organization and who's in tune with the industry trends. And that's where we're fundamentally seeing from a, an industry perspective that 
all these technologies are converging. And so for smaller companies, it's more of a challenge because you've got Excel-based data. How do you handle that? Well, Pod certainly can help solve some of that problem, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. Then it's other technologies like, well, okay, you've got dig information. How do you were capturing that and making sure you maintain that to future proof it so that you maintain that history? And when we get into even more advanced technologies like AI and digital twins, you know, certainly those are where the industry is going. And that's more on the bleeding or leading edge. But even for the rest of us to say, we've got to be able to fundamentally capture information about our assets to start with and get that governance in place before we're even ready to do anything else. Well, Monique, here at NICER, one of the things that we have found that I think has been very helpful, we have a department called Asset Knowledge Management, works very closely to what we call Asset Risk Management. And within Asset Knowledge Management, we have our closeout teams, we have our GIS team, we have teams that work on risk modeling. All this is well integrated so that as data comes in, we know that data is of high quality and that we're making informed decisions on that. I think the, the biggest benefit for NYSERS has been that we've actually split everything up into asset classes. We followed that ISO 55001 process, and that helps us make sure that we don't, as I would call them, uh, we don't have any orphan assets, right? Typically in the industry, we've talked about pipe, and that pipe has been distribution, transmission, and then we've talked about services. But if you think about your assets, they're much broader than that. So breaking things up into assets, back to your question around how do we ensure sustainability every asset has an asset class owner every asset has ownership every asset uh, has a yearly calibration cycle that tells us about how where is our data how is it moving what do we need to do and it holds us accountable as an organization all the way up to our senior leadership teams to make sure that we understand that we are making the progress we said we were going to make so I, I think there's a, a multitude of items here we could talk about but I think it goes back to what Todd said, it's governance and governance comes in different forms. We gotta make sure that we're delivering on what we said we were gonna do. So William, you guys are obviously best in class, right? I mean, you guys, you got you know a, a lot of really great stuff going on. You guys, it seems like you guys have been doing this for quite a while now, right? Todd's role was created, right? You guys uh, at, at Buckeye, so they've been doing this for a while too and, and, and NYSource as well. You guys sound very organized. And so what my next question is going to be is, how'd you get there? How did you sell this to management, right? How did you get them to understand? Because, William, I've heard you say this multiple times. How do you quantify something that never happened, right? So uh, how do you look at risk and say, oh, you're going to save all this money, these $11 billion that Jeff showed us earlier in that slide? Right, we're going to save that $11 billion or, or a fraction thereof um, by doing all of these processes. How did you guys get everybody on board? Because when we talk about data as an asset and capitalizing on data as an asset, we're talking about actual capital dollars, right? In my former role as a service provider, we wrote up proposals for clients that had specific verbiage in them to where they would align within their supply chain to a capital project rather than an O&M or an operations project. How, how did you guys do that? Can you walk us through that journey? Yeah, I'll start, Todd, and then hand it over to you. You know, I, I think order determines capacity. And what I mean by that is that oftentimes companies go out and they want to do it all. And the reality is that's a quick way to fail very quickly at managing your data. We started very, very simple. We went out to our employees and we said, what's the most important thing that we need to do right now to help you have a single source of truth around our data? And they started pointing us into one, two, three things that we could work on. Here's my feedback to anyone that's ever asked me that questions. And last year I had a chance to, to be at a conference and I had uh, two junior engineers ask me that same question. Hey, we love where you're taking this, but how do we sell this to our senior leadership? Uh, I have a great senior leadership team that really understands the value of data. They understand where we're at and where we need to go. And I think that's a first step. But it's painting that picture for where we're trying to get to. How do we make sure that we love the process today more than we love the product? I think we're often getting caught up and wanting to say, hey, what's the product we're going to get? How are we going to fix that? And often the question we should be asking is, what's the process? Back to your point, Monique. You got projects that are happening today. Are you capturing the right data? You got to stop the bleeding. You got to make sure that those projects get everything that you know you're going to need. 
then it's prioritizing and saying, how do we look back in time and say, what are the most critical attributes that we need to focus our time and attention to so that we can start staffing to drive that? And Todd, I, I know you guys have some great strategies you guys have employed. So I want to give you a little bit of time to, to jump in there as well. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And, you know, when you talk about process, you know, that's a huge consideration because it really is not only the going back to your point about ownership, who does what, but understanding who's responsible for that process. So for Buckeye, it was a matter of setting that vision. What do we really want this whole asset management strategy to look like? And where do we want to be in a future state? And that wasn't time box. It didn't say we have to be there in one year, five year. And the word that we continually use is journey because it is a journey. It is not something that you can say we're going to do in a year and be done. It's constantly evolving because technology is evolving, requirements are evolving, whether the regulatory, whether just because of acquisition factors. And so for us, the journey really started with first that vision. Where do we want to be able to get to? And then what do we need to have to be able to achieve that vision? It's defining those requirements. And we we pulled people, key stakeholders across the company. We had hundreds of people that have been involved with the project itself to start with just identifying those requirements. And we boiled them down to 109 initial requirements that we categorized. And then based on that categories, the categories, we then said, okay, what are those priorities? So William, your point, you know, you can't do it all. Even with 109, it might sound like a lot, may not sound like a lot, but either way, you can't do them all at once. So once we come up with those priorities, then say, well, based on those categories and those priorities, here's what we can accomplish and what we're gonna be able to do. That drove us to four key projects that we're looking at that are related to how we deal with our inventory management, that how we deal with mobile work order technology so that we can enable technologies in the field and make our field workers more efficient, more effective. Uh, it drove us in what we call ARPM, or Asset Reliability and Performance Monitoring, where we can capture information about our assets and how they're performing, tying into our SCADA systems and being able to understand when we're looking at the ability for condition-based maintenance, improving how our, our assets are operating. And then finally, our asset lifecycle enhancement, where we're trying to put more governance around our data. Uh, an interesting sidebar from our perspective is that one of the first things we found is that we had three different fields within our ERP that were called asset team. And people across the company were using them in different ways. So not only did I not know who was assigned an asset team, I didn't know how they were being used. So when we go back to governance, it comes down to defining that definition. What do we really mean and how are we using it? Because we can't use, if they're used for different things, we can't have them term the exact same thing. So it sets the stage for that journey. And while we've done a lot of great strides, there's still a lot of work to be done. And this is not something that you would do just an overnight type of project. It does take years to plan and to execute properly. Monique, I'm gonna jump in just really quickly to say, I love that conversation, really. I mean, these people are excellent. You know, I've had the opportunity to work with them. They have made a lot of progress. Um, it's hard earned too. And I think there's so much to talk about. I'm smelling podcast number two, you know, on this topic, because, you know, just thinking about what we can offer people are thoughts on efficiencies, right? Hey, having done this already, I can tell you if I were to do it again, I might do this, right? And mm -hmm. we touched on opportunistic field data gathering. That also requires you to know, right? Mm -hmm. What don't I know? Where mm -hmm. are, where do I have work being done? While they're there, can they capture data elements for me that help me complete my knowledge system, mm -hmm. right? There's a million things to talk about. I just wanted to compliment these guys because I really love listening to them talk. Yeah, I, I agree. We should we should keep talking about this uh, for sure. Two things that I want to, um, and it's always fun to hang out with you, Jeff, right? Of course. Uh, two things I want to bring up in the transition because I know we have here, you know, um, how do you how do you embark, right? How should how should one embark on this? And we have a bunch of different types of companies here, right? We have water companies on the call. We have you know we have uh, hydrogen. We have carbon sequestration, we have small operators, right? People that have less than 50 miles of federally regulated pipeline. So as a starting off place, um, you, I know you guys mentioned, um, you know, all of the attributes. William said, follow the attributes. On our next podcast next month, we have uh, FEMSA and uh, MPMS to come and talk to us about 13 new attributes that you're gonna need to capture if you aren't already. So that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about. So 
maybe as a baseline, you know, use the regulation as a baseline of what you need to be capturing, but of course, you know, grow upon that. And so I'll, I'll get you guys to transition next to, you know, why do we need all of these things? And, and really this question I think should be more around uh, what all does, does these processes touch and what all do these processes affect? And, and, and this is again, another way to help sell it right to your organization as a starting off point, right? William is the, what you talked about with the plan do check act um, uh, of PSMS. So would you guys mind giving us a little bit of color on, on what all uh, this affects within your organizations? William, you want to start? I'll take it away. <laughs> I think you said Todd take it away. Oh, Todd froze. All right. All right. So, I mean, it's hard to say how exactly should the wrong answer. <laughs> Did I freeze? You're good. Keep Am going. Yep. Am I back, Monique? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's just a matter of start somewhere because there is no magic bullet. There's no prescription to say this is what thou shalt do. It's a matter of taking information from all your peers, from the discussions you're hearing today, from talking to others and understanding what's going to work in your environment because it's not a one size fits all. It really is understanding what are you trying to get out of your objectives? What is the vision? Where do you want to be able to be? And at least starting there to say, what is it that we want it to look like? Is it modeling after someone else? Is it a smaller consideration? Is it strictly compliance? And that's fine if that's the answer, but starting somewhere to say, what do we really want this to look like? And then start to plan from there. And that's the, probably the best way to, to embark on the journey is to just start somewhere and say, what do we want it to look like and allow it to be organic? Hey, hey Monique, I'd look at the left-hand side and, and I would say that some of our audience is probably looking and going, I can understand operation, operations and maintenance, integrity management, but William, I'm a little lost with revenue and taxes, social responsibility, investment decisions and rate cases. And I want to make a connection there that I think is important is the more we dig into data, the more we start finding out that we know very little, and we need to know more. Uh, there's so many connections that we're starting to make around the data that we have, our customer population, uh, social responsibility. FIMSA just put out some great information around that. And how do we make better informed decisions so that in the past, we would look at a leak, say, on a gas line, a leak per mile. I remember those days. But today, we're looking around what's around it. Uh, what's the impact to that asset? How is that amp that asset uh, being impacted by weather? How's it being impacted by all of the work activities that are happening? And I think bringing all that information together and continuously making that cycle, this is not a once and done. You heard me talk a little bit earlier about asset classes. One of the things we started doing is building risk models in a prioritized manner. And to Jeff's point, how do you tell a senior leadership team that you're going to need two years to build an asset risk model that's going to make better decisions? You start telling the story of around the data that we have, the data we're going to gather, the decisions we're going to make that are going to help us reduce the risk. I want every single person on a call to just visualize this for, for just 10 seconds here. If I had a thousand miles of pipe, and I asked everyone to think about replacing 100 miles a year. The typical answer for risk reduction you would get is we're reducing 10% of our risk every year. But what if that first 100 miles has 90% of your risk? What if that first 100 miles has 5% of your risk? That's a really, really important discussion we need to have. So that's why I think the life cycle of assets is very important. More information we have, more we learn, better informed decisions we're going to make, and that's across all asset classes, so we don't leave those orphans behind. Mm -hmm. If I can jump in, Money, for just two seconds to say, I think those are both excellent points, right? But I would also throw in, it's, it's helpful to know where you are before you chart a path forward. And to do that, you have to know a little bit about where you've been. What's the history of my operations? Do I understand those clearly, right? And where am I? Monique, you'll recall, we used to do these system assessments were very inexpensive, right? You would bring in and some experts and say, before you get going on this, why don't you bring in a few people, it only takes a couple of days, you do a bunch of interviews and you go, okay, now I understand where you are in governance. You know, I know where you are on your systems and all of that. And here's a bunch of places you can start. And then it's up to the company to say, 
hey, our resources will allow us to do this, or we think that's mm -hmm. the highest priority, but mm -hmm. know where you are and where you've been. And then I think Todd, great point is like, you got to know where you're going, right? Because then mm -hmm. you can start to chart a path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and guys, and we're running a little low on time, of course, right? We should have done this for an hour and a half. I know we could talk all day long about this stuff, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, you know, how you, I think we already covered how you get started and, and how you sell it and how you future-proof it. Um, I want to jump in a little bit around, because you guys have been talking about the entire asset life cycle. You've been talking about where do you start. You've been talking about, um, you know, how do you have that transparency of what's your, where your pipeline is, what's in your pipeline, and what's around your pipeline as well. Um, it's all very important stuff. And and I think if, if you're a small operator and you don't have those dollars to, to bring somebody in and do a, um, a, a, a full, you know, analysis of your system, what you do have is a network, right? And so at the Pods Association especially, you have a network of people that you can talk to about their journey, right? And I, I know that Todd and, and William would be more than welcome to, to keep talking about their journeys and, and what's been going on there. And I do sense a part two coming on, Jeff, so good point there. Um, but I, I want to talk about, you know, specifically around the Pods Association, or I might even ask Todd to do it. Um, he's been uh, uh, in the association longer than I have, that's for sure. But, you know, the way that we can support you guys is, is, through this model that we've built, right, this most recent 7.0.1 model, you can build anything on top of it. And um, it's recognizable for a lot of different business processes. So uh, we have a work group right now that's actively creating a situation where you can, you can point to um, a run and you can figure out why did I do this run, right? Why was this ILI done? You know, where, where did this come from and where is it a part of my business process? And then the entire asset life cycle, right? The POS model supports everything from upstream all the way through to downstream. So if you're looking to move to Esri's utility network right now, which I think there are some quite a few that are doing that, uh, we're going to release UNET for pods in October, which is, again, another way for you to organize, bring about data governance, and also uh, to bring transparency into your data. So, Todd, do you want to talk a little bit more about the new 7.0.1 model? Sure. And what I'll reinforce, Monique, is that while we kind of talk a lot about whether it's up, mid, or downstream within the industry, it's not exclusive. That the model is very flexible, that it can be adaptable for smaller operators, for gas distribution, for water lines, anywhere there's a pipe, it's very flexible. And it's also developed to the point where you can add on other types of data. So we've put a baseline of asset data. We've started with a data dictionary that helps on the government side of things. But it also allows you to be able to bring in other types of data. If there's something specific in a terminal that maybe the model doesn't address to your liking, you can edit those lookup tables. You can edit any of the tables. You can add on tables. You can link them. So it was designed to be very flexible. And um, it kind of evolved from a number of different versions as we've gotten feedback from the industry itself. Yeah. And so we'll finish up just real quick. Like I, I plugged the upcoming podcast that we have going on. You can take a picture of your screen with the QR code to be able to um, uh, register for those. One of the things that the guys talked about is what's important around your pipeline. So all of our pods association members have access to all of our resource centers, which we have a regulatory resource center that gives you all of the regulations, not just federal, but all of the state regulations where you may have um, assets within specific states. We also have thousands of data layers that are free and they're hosted remotely. Um, so you, it doesn't take up room on your server. So you can add all of those data layers uh, into your system to know more about what's around your pipeline too. So we got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Pod supports all um, pipelines, uh, so matters not uh, what's in your pipeline. Um, all of those data tables can support all of them. And we have a lot of cool stuff coming up too. So you guys get involved, uh, and let us know and start uh, being a part of this community so that you have access to all of these beautiful brains that you see on the screen. Uh, and and you, we guys can, we can get move the ball forward insofar as pipeline safety is concerned. So I want to thank all of our guests. Thank you so much, William. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you so much, Todd, for spending some time with us this morning. Any, any closing words that you guys want to share? I'll just say thank you to the audience. You know, uh, as I know William would say for me, 
you know, learning is really like one of the most primary features of a smart, um, safe organization, the ability to learn and keep learning. So thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. You guys have a safe day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.